Hi, welcome to a, a little video that I've called the 10 biggest clangers in Bible translation. Now, um, the Bible is the most important book in the world. Many people would agree with that, or at least if we say one of the most important books in the world, and it's been very influential uh, right around the world. But most people have had to read it in translation and um, it's been translated more times than any other book, over ten times more than the second most translated book, which is also a book very much influenced by the Bible. I wonder if you might like to think what that book is. Pause for a minute. Yeah, the book is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, written in the 17th century, and you're very much influenced by the Bible, and, that's, and that has become the second most translated book in the world, only in the hundreds of languages that it, it's been translated into, whereas the Bible has been translated into thousands of languages. And those translations have mostly been done well, very well. But as you might expect, a few mistakes have been made, some of them um, accidental, some of them perhaps on purpose. and. Um, so we have these mistakes and uh, you could call them clangers um, and I, I've combed through uh, some of them and I've made a choice uh, I made a little list of 10 of them and I'm going to count them down from 10, 9, 8 down to right down to 3, 2, 1 so the first ones are perhaps more of a joke than anything uh, uh, amusing but when, when we get down to three, two, one, these are a little more serious, particularly because of the um, strong, uh, of the widespread influence that they've had. And um, I don't have a, a, a bell to clang, but I'm going to ding this little dinner bell to um, indicate each one. Okay, so let's begin. We'll start with number 10. Okay, so here we are, clang number 10. This translation says, Jesus says, I am in the Father Mother, and the Father Mother is in me. John chapter 17, verse 20. This comes from the inclusive version of the New Testament and Psalms, published in 1995. Well, it's true that many modern Westerners struggle with the male-oriented society that the Bible comes out of, but still, this seems to go rather too far. Cling it in work. Number nine. If someone sues you for your shirt, give up your coat as well. Matthew 540 from the C E V. Now I should say that the C E V is a very good translation, which I like, but here I feel they've made a bit of a clangor. A bit of a clangor. They ignoring the fact that to sue you for your shirt is a well known idiom in English meaning to sue you for all you've got. So best to translate, I think, like the, for example, the NIV did, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your coat as well. So um, giving up the attempt to um, put it into modern kind of idiom and um, modern dress, if you like, and um, pointing out that they wore a different kind of clothes, provided this word is... is uh, reasonably known. I guess people can guess what it is, but it doesn't run into the problem of this English idiom that has a distracting wrong meaning. Number eight from the J.B. Phillips New Testament 1958. Again, an excellent translation. But in Luke chapter 22 verse 3, um, Satan entered Judas, is what um, a, a straight translation would say. J.B. Phillips changed it to a diabolical plan came into the mind of Judas. And in Luke 13, 11, a woman who had been crippled by a spirit, an evil spirit, that is, becomes a woman who was ill from some psychological cause. So it's a fairly blatant case of a translator imposing his world view in his translation. Okay, number seven. 
the new Swedish translation, Bible 2000, came out in the year 2000, has 67 gaps in the Old Testament. Um, there's places where the translators ha haven't even tried to translate it, they've just left gaps, for example. Like the first one occurs in Genesis chapter 15, verse 2, the second part. It's quite an obscure bit of Hebrew, and no one is quite sure what it's trying to say. The CEV um, has a stab at it and gives a footnote, one possible meaning for this difficult Hebrew text. But I think it's a clangor for the translators to just leave it out. I mean, this is what you're being paid for. My dad was a carpenter. He said if the boss tells you to take this door off and fix it, you can't say to him, it's too hard to get this door off. Take the hammer to it if necessary, but you have to get it off. That's your job. But, I mean, even our standard English translations do the same thing sometimes. Sila is a word that occurs in the Psalms. Again, no one is quite sure of what it means, but the NIV 2011 doesn't translate it, although they have a footnote saying the Hebrew has sila, a word of uncertain meaning here. Um, Peter Craigie, in his word Biblical Commentary on Psalms, writes a bit about the meaning of sila, which first occurs at Psalm 3 verse 2, and he gives several suggestions for the meaning but um, I think the translators should opt for one of them and give a footnote. The NLT uses the translation interlude and um, gives a footnote uh, saying that the meaning is uncertain. And there are other un uh, uncertain meaning words in the Psalms as well, such as Hegaion. But yes, I definitely think it's a bit of a clangor just to leave a gap when um, you're the translator, you're supposed to. Have, have your best shot at it, at least, not just leave it out. Number six. Number six, we come to illustrations, notes, and printer's errors. An edition of the Bishop's Bible in 1572 contained pictures of some scenes from the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses. At the start of the book of Hebrews, we see Leda and the Swan, which David Daniels in his book, The Bible in English, says, a printing tradition of splendid inappropriateness. Then we come to the Geneva Bible, which, ha a, which was a 16th century version, which uh, was written from the Reformed uh, tradition, and it had some quite strongly worded notes. Here's one, a note to the translation of Revelation 11.7, says, the beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit is the Pope, which hath his power out of hell, and cometh thence. So, um, that's just one of the uh, strongly worded um, notes in the Geneva Bible, in the days of um, strong controversy and debate and dispute and argument between the Protestants and the Catholics. Here's another interesting one. Um, in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul advises Timothy to drink some wine for the sake of his stomach. James Moffat's New Testament put the verse into a footnote, the whole verse into a footnote. James Moffat belonged to the Scottish Free Church, and of course they had uh, strong views on alcohol. So James Moffat put this whole verse right into a footnote. Um, now we come on to printer's errors, and there are some amusing ones here. The Wicked Bible of 1631 says, Thou shalt commit adultery in Exodus 20 verse 14. I wonder if you can think of the word that they left out from that verse. Um, Despite receiving a £300 fine for that in 1641, the same press printed an edition in which they omitted the word no in Revelation 21.1. And so they had it saying, and there was more C. In 1653, another, a print, another printer omitted the second negative in 1 Corinthians 6.9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God. Number five. In Acts 2, 12, 17, we read um, Peter's words, Tell James what has happened. 
However, there's a small problem here. If you read Acts chapter 12, you see that in verse 2, James got killed. Isn't this a strange thing? You might want to pause and um, try and figure out what, what, what's gone wrong there. What's the problem? Well, the answer is that um, to Luke's original audience, James, without further specification, was the well-known, long-serving leader of the church. For them, the other James, the brother of John, had to be specified as he is in verse 2. But for readers today, both, I think, need to be specified. And I strongly suspect that many, many translations have failed to do this. Note that in some cultures, the spirits of beheaded men are believed to be unusually powerful. So, yeah, I was checking a translation once in New Guinea, and uh, they pointed this out to me. And so the translators um, made sure that they specified which James was which, and this one that Peter was talking about in verse 17 is not the same as the James in verse 2, who got killed. Number 4. The 144,000 of Revelation in Revelation chapter 14 verse 1, the number of the elect. The Jehovah's Witnesses today are one group that take this number literally. Once when one of them came to my door, I looked up Revelation 21.16 to try and make my point. In this verse, John gives the dimensions of the New Jerusalem. And um, he says it's pure gold, 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 stadia. Surely, I was going to say, you don't think they mean a real block of gold of those dimensions will be lowered down from heaven to earth. But when I found the verse in my Good News Bible, I discovered that the 12,000 stadia had been replaced by 2,400 kilometers. With the numbers changed like that, it can only be taken literally. The translators should have left the stadia measure, an ancient, um, ancient world measure that we no longer use these days, but I think clear enough to everyone that it is some sort of measure. They should have left the, the, that so that these numbers could remain unchanged in the symbol, symbolization, um, the symbolism of the numbers could be um, seen, at least if not uh, understood immediately, it could be explained. Twelve is the number of Israel and the number of God's people, and ten represents completeness. So, um, both 144,000, which is 12 by 12 by 10 by 10 by 10, in other words, doubly and triply complete, and um, 12,000 high, 12,000 wide, 12,000 deep, um, both really are, are different ways of representing in numbers the full number of God's people. Number three, the word was a God. I wonder if you know what translation this is found in. Uh, it's John 1.1 1, 1, and it's the New World translation used by uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. I discussed this verse in more detail in my New Testament Greek lesson 7. It's a possible translation of this verse in isolation. But the rest of the New Testament clearly shows it's wrong. And um, the bias of the um, New World Translation is seen in other places. For example, the word other is inserted four times before things in Colossians 1, 16 to 17, making Christ one of the other created thing. Number two, in Titus 1, 6, we read... Uh, an elder must be the husband of one wife. So the King James Version and uh, a lot of other translations. This is a passage that has had a huge impact on missionary work all around the world for many years. Um, and the same expression occurs in 1 Timothy 3.2, 3.12 and 5.9. 
Now, on the face of it, this seems to be directed against uh, polygamy. It must be the husband of one wife. So missionaries told their converts they had to get rid of all but one wife. As a result, a lot of women were turned out and left helpless. And many husbands and their wives simply rejected Christianity because of it. Uh, polygamy has always been a widespread practice. Someone estimated that it's been allowed in over two-thirds of the world's cultures, including the ancient Jews. So scholars did think for a while that this expression was intended, literally directed against uh, polygamy among uh, Jewish and perhaps other communities at the time. But polyandry, one woman with several husbands, certainly wasn't. So the use of the same idiom in 1 Timothy 5, 9, referring to uh, a widow, is pretty good proof that the meaning isn't literal. But apart from that, to me, as I read it in Greek, it just uh, smacks of an idiom and it is now generally recognized <coughs> um, as an idiom meaning uh, faithful in marriage and here's a study in the journal for the study of the New Testament and we see that the NIV ha <coughs> has recognized this in 1984 they said the husband of but one wife but the NIV 2011 changed it recognized the idiom um, saying faithful to his wife and we read the same in oh, CEV actually says faithful in marriage so um, there we have it and coming in at number one in sin did my mother conceive me Psalm 51 verse 5 the, the hugely influential 4th century church father Augustine took this verse, which read very similar uh, to this, what I have here, in the uh, Latin version that he had, Augustine took it to mean <coughs> that sex was a sin, even in marriage. And uh, this left the church with a big negative about sex, which in turn caused a lot of problems. But in fact, this is not what David is saying at all. The problem comes from reading the Bible um, as if it was a textbook setting out deadpan theological propositions. In fact, David is using overstatement to strongly emphasize his sinful nature. A good tr translation can make this clear by using things such as exclamation mark exclamation point, uh, these um, things weren't available to scribes in the ancient world, but since they are available to us, not using an exclamation mark can signal that it is to be taken deadpan. Uh, in addition, some rephrasing can make it clearer, as we see in the NLT, New Living Translation, I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Well, those are my 10. If anyone happens to be still watching, you might like to chip in some of your thoughts, your ideas or your choices for this, um, uh, this little, little selection of clangers in Bible translation.